Hello, everyone. Welcome back this week, another Bible study as we get ready to worship this coming Sunday. Uh, it's Friday as I'm doing this, the Friday before uh, the sixth Sunday of the season of Easter. We're about halfway through the month of May, a lot of stuff going on around us. Uh, and as we get to the halfway point of the month, we find ourselves near the end of that season of the church year called Easter. So after this coming Sunday, there'll be one more, uh, the last Sunday of Easter, the seventh Sunday, and sandwiched in between those two, uh, a wonderful uh, sandwich, uh, we'll have the festival of the Ascension of our Lord, and you will have an opportunity to worship on Thursday for the Ascension, and uh, well, I encourage you to do that. It's uh, one of the, the great seasons of the church here that doesn't get uh, the attention, I think, uh, that it deserves. But anyway, last week, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people for all you King James people. Uh, you are a people belonging to God, a people treasured by God. It's good to know who you are. Good to remember who you are. Good times, bad times, all the times uh, in between. But keep going. You are all those things. Why? So that you can show forth, so that you can proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. And that really hits at the theme uh, for this sixth Sunday of Easter. Uh, the life of the believer, our Christian walk, and uh, what being a follower of the risen Lord says about that and what that means for us. So uh, keep that in mind as we uh, move ahead to introduce our lesson for today. Uh, let me get the, the outline up on the screen so that we can follow along together with that. All right, there we go. We're going to do a slideshow and we're going to do it from the beginning. Always good to start at the beginning, right? All right, Easter 6, what is love? There is the theme of the uh, meditations from the devotions uh, for this week. Uh, and uh, when we get done here today, uh, well, you'll see why that's an appropriate uh, theme uh, for not only the individual devotions for the week, but uh, this second lesson of the day that we're gonna be looking at, and really uh, everything that uh, the disciple John, who was our author today, uh, what he was all about. Uh, you maybe notice that again, we are doing the supplemental second lesson of the day. So uh, you'll probably still hear uh, from First Peter, uh, in our worship on Sunday. I don't know that for sure, but I'm guessing that it'll be there somewhere. Uh, but the meditations, again, is following the uh, the alternate or supplemental second lesson. And so that's what we're going to do. That's what we'll do for uh, our Bible study today. All right. Yeah, all right. There's my email, my phone number, so you can call me, text me, email me questions, comments, whatever, come back to that at the end, also as an offer that I am holding out there uh, for you. The opening prayer takes us to the prayer of the day for Easter 6. Father of lights, every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Amen. Yeah, that fits nicely with um, the, the, the overall focus uh, of Easter 6. Uh, I've been pointing out to you the wonderful way God gives us different ways to know him and call upon him, his different names, and here's another one the Father of Lights. All right, well, we're gonna come back to this prayer and one of our questions of the day, so let's keep plugging along. Uh, just take a minute to see the big, the big picture of Easter 
uh, for this year with all the Sundays of Easter and the different themes that we've looked at so far uh, and where we are today, Easter 6. Uh, he lives, he lives who once was dead. The Redeemer lives. And today and this week as we worship, we are reminded that he lives to call me to live for him. There's that life of the believer again. All right, I hinted that we're going to be putting our First Peter back on the bookshelf. We're going to go a couple of books further and grab First John, uh, chapter three, verses thirteen to eighteen. Uh, don't forget Peter. Like I said, you're probably going to hear about him in worship, uh, and you can go back uh, and read those verses on your own. Uh, read the tweener verses uh, that we've talked about, and if you haven't already, or even if you have another good opportunity to uh, just take a little time and read through that entire little letter of First Peter. But the point is, is for now on, you're going to have to do that on your own. We're doing First John today. Uh, next Sunday on Easter 7, we're going to use another one of the supplemental lessons from First Corinthians. Uh, but don't forget Peter. He's well worth your time, as is John, uh, as you'll see uh, today. We're in chapter three. Uh, if you look at the meditations, you will see, whoop, I didn't want to do that yet. Uh, you will see that uh, the author of the meditations for, for this week actually goes back and begins with, with verse 11 and includes verse 12 and then 13 to 18. The actual appointed lesson is 13 to 18. That's fine, works either way. Uh, it all uh, fits together. Uh, very neatly and very nicely like you know verse 11 simply says this is the message you heard from the beginning well, what's the message we should love one another and uh, that sets the stage uh, for what's going to be coming and the verses that that we're looking at all right quick word about John the author of this little epistle uh, he's that disciple, one of the chosen 12, also one of those chosen three, the, the inner circle, we sometimes call them, Peter, James, and then John. And uh, while well, you read the Gospels and you hear enough uh, about them, uh, and John is certainly uh, one of those that was part of that inner circle, and it was obvious he also was going to be one of those three pillars uh, of the early church, uh, in those years after the ascension of our Lord. Uh, John and his brother James, uh, the sons of Zebedee, were told that, not because Zebedee is going to play such a big role in the story, because he doesn't, but, but I think it's just one of those things where God reminds us in his word that the story of salvation uh, and the story of our Savior didn't exist in a vacuum, uh, this is a story involving real people, real lives, just like us. John and James, like some of the other disciples, were fishermen. Uh, they had moms and dads. Uh, they had lives. Uh, they had strengths and weaknesses. In other words, they're just like you and me. Um, so these are the sons of Zebedee. Their mother, we believe, was Salome. And if that name sounds familiar to you, um, it's because uh, she was one of the, the group of women that uh, were always there to minister to Jesus, take care of his physical needs, and those of the disciples. And also on Easter, Salome shows up as uh, one of the ladies who uh, was going to perform, she thought, her last act of service for her, her dead Lord, a soon-to-be-risen Lord, and was also one of those that got to be one of the first witnesses and then messengers uh, of the resurrection. John's a gospel writer, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, John's different than the other three, and all you got to do is read it, and, and you'll see uh, that it's, it's different. Uh, and it's, a, it's the gospel that very often uh, we will give to people who are new to the faith, because it presents Jesus uh, as Savior and Lord in a very good and, and simple way. He also wrote these three letters near the end of the New Testament, 
uh, and they are little gems. And as we're going to see today, uh, First John may be a little letter, uh, but it is anything but but insignificant. It is very very meaty, and we're going to have to keep moving uh, just to even get a taste of of some of the things that the Holy Spirit led him to write for us. And then John was the disciple who, as an old man, probably. Um, in his 90s, near the end of the first century, uh, who was blessed with a, a vision and a revelation from Jesus Christ. And that last revelation of God in Scripture, uh, telling God's people what the future holds. What's the future hold for the believer? What does the future hold for the church as we wait uh, for the risen Lord to come again on the last day? And that takes us to uh, the city of Ephesus, which uh, John is often connected to, especially uh, later in his life, that that uh, significant city. The Apostle Paul helped to found the congregation there and wrote a very wonderful media letter to that congregation. That was also the home of John. And uh, it's that city on the far west side of what we call Turkey today, Asia Minor then. And if you ever get a chance to visit Ephesus, do it. Uh, you can actually literally walk on the very streets that St. Paul and, and John would have walked on. And not only that, uh, John, you remember, was made guardian of the mother of our Lord. Uh, and so it's a pretty strong tradition uh, that Mary also lived out her life uh, and died in the city of Ephesus. And if you visit there, you'll see plenty of references and sites dealing uh, with that. Uh, just off the coast of Ephesus is the island of Patmos, a little island where John was banished, uh, placed in exile uh, because of his faith and confession of the risen Lord, and it was there that he was given that vision of, uh, of revelation. Uh, if you want to remember one thing about John, and it's real easy to remember when you read him, uh, he is called the Apostle of Love. Uh, you read his gospel. It's John who gives us chapter 3, verse 16. The, all, the whole of the gospel in a nutshell. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And it's in uh, his epistles that we hear things like, God is love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loves us. We love because he loved us first. That's all John, all in his uh, little letters near the end of the New Testament. And like Peter, he was offering encouragement to believers, believers who often have to stumble and bumble and struggle uh, living this side of heaven in a world uh, that is not always conducive to the Christian faith and the, the Christian life. And he offers words of encouragement, but also words of warning about to watch out for the false teachers and the false teachings and hold on uh, to the teachings of Christ. And as you do that, then it's only going to be natural to do what? To love one another. All right, John. Here's our verses for today. Chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. Let's get right at it. Uh, do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. Yeah, a lot packed into that little sentence, too. You might want to ask, well, why shouldn't we be surprised? Uh, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Well, why? Well, one thing we know is that the, the Lord himself said, and, and the New Testament word says, and the Old Testament gives plenty of evidence of it, too. Uh, if they're going to hate and persecute and, and uh, question and doubt or whatever, uh, the Lord, uh, well, then those that follow him shouldn't be surprised if they get a little taste of that too. Uh, take up his cross and follow him. Well, that's cross-bearing. And very often uh, that cross-bearing comes because of the disdain and yes, even the hatred of the world. And why? Why, why did they hate Jesus so much? Uh, why would, would they hate us? Maybe that is surprising to you. 
Well, think of who Jesus is. Think of what Jesus said. Uh, the message of the gospel is, is so counterintuitive. It's so countercultural. Jesus says, I am the way, the only way. I am the truth, the only truth. Um, I am the life. The only way to have true life is through me. Uh, that doesn't come natural to us. Uh, that goes against our, our very nature. And then he comes along and says uh, that we need to repent. Uh, he, he calls us out on our sin. And his message of the law is not a pleasant one or an easy one uh, to take. So don't be surprised uh, if the, because the world hates him. And, and don't be surprised then that, that they hate you. Um, and quite frankly, they, they hate him, hated him, and still hate him and those who follow him because God doesn't always turn out the way people want him to be. Uh, people have different ideas about God. Too many people think that God's main purpose is to be uh, a year-round divine Santa Claus, uh, to make sure that, that he's there to always give us whatever it is that think we want and when we want it. And if he doesn't, well, what's that all about? Uh, and that can lead not only to questioning and doubting God, but... Yes, even to saying, I, I don't want anything to do with a God like that. And um, the world lashes out at that. When, when, when he's not the kind of God we want him to be. Just think of the, um, the, the Jews of his day. Who, when, when they saw this carpenter's son from Nazareth, this simple, humble, uh, love-teaching rabbi, that didn't fit the mold uh, of the kind of Messiah they uh, had come to expect. And when he uh, wouldn't be that, and wouldn't, he wouldn't be that bread king for them. Uh, many not only left him, but, well, in the end, crucify him, crucify him. Huh? And if you don't, uh, if you are surprised that the world would hate us and don't always see it, well, then maybe you're, you're blessed. <laughs> uh, then again, maybe you're not looking real hard. But I can guarantee you, you stand up in a crowd uh, and, and, and take a stand on what Jesus says and what he uh, teaches. And I guarantee you, you will find some pushback. And uh, you, you stand with him. And there are going to be those uh, that will not only say, well, hey, that's your thing. You do your own thing. That's not for me. It's not only going to be maybe just a few digs here now and then and, and uh, maybe a little ridicule uh, here and there and, and maybe uh, a little uh, leaving you out of stuff. Uh, sometimes uh, when you live and you proclaim the truth of the gospel, uh, you're, you're going to get pushed back. Try it. Uh, you'll see. You, you're not going to lose your life. Well, even though today there are places where that happens, chances are real good here in Marquette County that you're not going to lose your life uh, for preaching and teaching and believing and living for Jesus. But it is possible that, uh, that you could lose a job. You could lose some status among friends and acquaintances, whatever. Uh, yeah, don't be surprised if the world hates you. Okay. Uh, and yeah, and we're, we're going to see in a little bit the, the, the talk about the fruits of faith. And I'll come back to that a, a little bit, but this thought a little bit when we take a look at that. Verse 14. We know, and I like the positive way that begins. We know that we have crossed over from death to life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. We know. Well, what do we know? We know that, that we've crossed over from death to life. That's just a beautiful, uh, picturesque way of saying, we know that we are believers. We know that we are the children of God. We know that we are saved by the grace of God. And how can you know that? What's one of the evidences of that? Well, it's the way that we love one another. 
because we love our brothers. Uh, maybe I need to go back here a little bit uh, when I see that word brothers again. There's a footnote behind brothers in verse 13 uh, in my Bible, and you can see it on the screen. And, and what the footnote is saying there is this. When the context indicates, when the context uh, allows it, that word, that Greek word that John used for brothers may also refer to all fellow believers, not just male, but female. Yeah, the, the word means brothers, but it's also the kind of word that uh, in a certain context means everybody. So this would be an appropriate place, and some translations have done it, it says, don't be surprised, brothers and sisters. Uh, we have crossed over from death to life because we love our brothers and sisters in the faith, our fellow believers. Uh, in Bible translating lingo, this is called inclusive language. And different translations struggle with inclusive language to one degree or another. Uh, some just, you know, it's, you know, there's, there's no limit. Um, the, the inclusive language is used even to the point where where God should be or could be referred to as as a she and and not a he, uh, or when the context allows it, it's obvious here that John is not just saying that the world is going to hate all the the men believers. Uh, that we'll know that we are believers because of the way we love our our male brothers. No, he's talking about all believers. All believers don't be surprised if the world hates you. Uh, all believers can know that you are a believer because of the way we love one another. Okay, uh, so just a good little tidbit there for you. So one of the fruits of faith that we're going to be talking about is, is that we love one another. Jesus said, this is how they'll know that you're my disciples, by the way you love one another. And the, the, the opposite is also true. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. No, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, just the end of, of verse 14 there. The one who does not love remains in death. Now, being not very good at loving one another being not very consistent in the way we love our brothers and sisters and others, both in and outside the faith, that does not automatically mean that you don't have faith. It can mean that, uh, but it can also mean that faith is, is weak. Faith needs to be strengthened and nourished. Uh, when, when the tree is not producing fruit, then you need to, to do some fertilizing and uh, maybe do some pruning of that tree, which isn't always pleasant and maybe looks like you killed the tree, uh, but in reality, uh, that tree is going to be more fruitful when it's all said and done. But when there are no fruits, you've got every reason to go out there in the backyard and say, you know, there's no fruit on this tree. Again, I wonder if it's alive. And when continually, continually it refuses to bear fruit, then you're going to cut it down. So one of the evidences that, that we are the children of God is that it's going to show. Now, don't misunderstand. This is not saying because we love one another, we are believers. Because we love one another, God loves and forgives us. No, um, th this love that we are to show is not the cause of faith, it's the fruit of faith. That's where your old adage, let the scripture interpret scripture, work. And scripture is just not going to allow you to make your loving be the cause of God's loving you. We love because God loved us first. Verse 15, interesting verse, shows you that if nothing else, John was paying attention uh, when Jesus preached his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. 
he, he says that everyone who hates his brother uh, is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. This is one of those commandments where a person might say, well, there's at least one that I haven't broken. I haven't murdered anyone. Well, yeah, maybe not, huh? Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Um, I, I guess in so many words, I think this is in the, uh, the people's Bible. Uh, yeah, here's a, 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 a great line. John calls hatred the moral equivalent of murder. The moral equivalent of murder. Chances are real good you're never going to get arrested because of hatred. You may get arrested and be in big trouble uh, if you do a hate crime. If your hatred, what's in here, expresses itself out here, either in something that you say or something that you do. But the hatred itself is in the heart. And since you can't see what's in a heart, well, you, you may not get arrested for, for hating. Uh, there may be other consequences, uh, but what Jesus said, what John is saying here is that, that hatred is the, the moral equivalent of murder. In other words, uh, and the Bible teaches this, God wants us clean on the outside, yes. Uh, live a Christian life, love one another, uh, but he also wants us clean on the inside. And when we're clean on the inside, then the clean on the outside is not only going to be more often, uh, but also more obvious. Live your faith is what we're, we're saying here. All right, we, we want to keep moving on. Uh, verse 16, we've talked about love versus hate. Now we're going to talk about love and what goes along with that, compassion. Love versus hate, 13, 14, 15, love and compassion, 16 to 18. Uh, and here's the meat and potatoes. This is how we have come to know love. This is how we know what love really is. This is where the theme for the meditations comes for this week. You know, what is love? Well, we don't look inside of us to get the true definition of love. We don't always look around us to find a definition of love. Both of those at a certain point in time in one degree or another are always going to come up short. This is how we have come to know love. Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. There's the love of God with legs. And Jesus didn't just say it. He didn't just say, hey, love you guys. No, Jesus laid down his life for us. We saw that on Good Shepherd Sunday, too. And because we know and believe that, there is the motivation. There is the inspiration. Uh, there is the strength and the ability uh, for us to love and to lay down our lives for our brothers in the way that we uh, love them and show our love uh, to them. You'll see this a lot in John. God is love. This is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. We love because he loved us first. And there are more. Uh, there is the essence. There is the source. Uh, there is the power and the cause and the motivation for true love. It's not just an emotion. It's not just a feeling. It's God in action. It's, it's Jesus. And so verse 17 follows, whoever has worldly wealth and sees his brother in need, but closes his heart against him, 
how can God's love remain in him? Yeah. We've been loved. We have God's love shown to us. We have God's love filling our hearts. And when we have that tremendous resource of God's love, uh, it's only natural and it's only the way he designed it that that love uh, is going to, to ooze out uh, toward others. God doesn't want us to only be a sponge that soaks up all of his love. Yeah, we need to do that. But that love that we have soaked up for ourselves, then also uh, is to be uh, used and shared uh, and shown toward, toward others. It's one of those, well, as we're going to see in a minute, those fruits of faith. Weakness in love, lack of love, like I said before, isn't always a sign of no faith, of unbelief. Uh, but just like a tree that's not bearing a fruit, uh, when the believer is not bearing fruit, then you need to check your spiritual pulse. You need to check your spiritual vital uh, signs. Uh, because if faith isn't already dead, um, it's getting there. And it needs then to be nourished and strengthened with more of God's love for us. James talks about this a lot too, and uh, we're going to talk about James here in just a second. But let's finish it up. Uh, dear children, oh, I love that. Uh, this is the almighty, holy, eternal God uh, calling his runaway, rebellious children his children, dear children. Uh, that's good news, folks. Don't lose sight of those little addresses that God uses uh, for us. He, uh, he's our father, uh, and he calls us his dear children because of his son, our big brother, Jesus. Dear children, let us love not only with word or with our tongue, but also in action and in truth. One of the devotions of this week in meditation talks about uh, let us love out loud. <coughs> I like that too. Uh, not just with words. Yeah, that's important too. Clear confession, uh, a confident confession of our faith. Uh, be a good witness, absolutely. But don't be just hearers of the word, be doers also, right? Uh, love also in action and in truth. Love out loud, to use that example. Uh, be because, and, and uh, the People's Bible makes a good point of this, and I, and I like it. Uh, this is that whole concept of practicing what you preach. And when you don't, that's not good. This is that where they talk about don't just uh, talk the talk, but walk the walk. Because when you don't, they're going to see it. And, and even worse, when you talk the talk and, and your walk is not only non-existent, but it's contrary to the talk. Uh, the point is, is that talking the talk without walking the walk doesn't fool too many people, huh? Even unbelievers, especially unbelievers, can smell religious hypocrisy from an astonishing distance. Uh, you can smell hypocrisy a mile away. And if you wanna, if you wanna do some damage uh, to the Christian faith, uh, don't practice what you preach and don't care. Uh, then, then be a, a Sunday morning occasionally Christian. Um, and believe me, uh, they'll see that. And believe me, uh, there will be fruits for that too. Dear children, my dear children, 
for the sake of our risen Lord, let us love not only with word and with our tongue, but also in action and in truth. All right, there's, there's tons more stuff there that I could say, but I won't because uh, we don't want to run out of time, which I'm known to do, by the way, just because I get off tangents just like this. So let's keep moving to our questions of the day. Uh, there's that tree I was referring to, the fruits of the Spirit. We're going to see it again, so I'm going to skip over it here. Question number one, the love of God who lives in us leads to a life of love. Uh, which is kind of uh, uh, the theme of our lesson for today and this Sunday of, of Easter 6, and certainly a, a theme of John's first epistle, that love of God toward us leads to a life of love. Uh, so you can kind of take a look at the grace train over here. Uh, that train of, of God's grace, his love uh, in Christ Jesus. The engine that pulls the train is the fact of the gospel, that saving truth of Jesus Christ and him crucified, our living, crucified, and risen, and soon to be ascended, Lord. That's the engine that pulls the train. That's grace. And what follows grace, then, is the gift of the Holy Spirit, who uses the gospel as his tool to create saving faith and to also to give us the willingness and the ability to obey going to talk about obedience for a second in a second here uh, as we move on. But uh, the, the engine of God's grace of the gospel pulls uh, the car of faith and obedience. And, and then along with it comes the good works. It's part of the train. It's attached to the train. It's going to be attached to the train. It's natural for it to be part of the train. But it's being pulled by the love of God. But this love of God leads to the life of love, uh, the fruits of faith, the good works that follow. Um, we like to say, uh, Lutherans like to say, uh, good works are necessary. No, they're not necessary in order to become a believer, but good works are necessary for a believer. One of the confirmands uh, this week uh, asked me ab about a question he had to write about. The, the question you often hear is, uh, you, you don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Well, yeah, absolutely correct, but absolutely wrong. Uh, you don't go to church to become a Christian, um, and you don't have to go to church to, to be one, but yet people who are Christians go to church because the good works is connected uh, to the engine. So in light of that, let's talk about these two little truths. Faith without works is dead. That's, that's straight out of the Bible. That's from the epistle of James. Uh, James, who's not talking about justification here, he's talking about sanctification. People have tried to say that James and, and his less message about works is contrary and the opposition to St. Paul, who talks about faith, by grace through faith. No, they're not this. They are this. They work together. Uh, James agrees with Paul wholeheartedly, and Paul agrees with James wholeheartedly. Paul is emphasizing, in fact, Paul can hardly speak without talking about God's grace and God's declaring us not guilty. Well, uh, James is talking about and he's emphasizing uh, the life of the believer. So, yeah, faith that has no works, if it's not dead, you better check because it will be. Uh, you've heard it said, especially at Reformation time, by faith alone. Amen. But we say faith. I should say, the Bible says, faith is never alone. Faith that's real, faith that's alive, produces fruits. B, a sanctification-only theology drains you 
rather than replenishes you. You see that's in the quotations. That's a quote I saw this week and I'm not gonna talk about the, the context behind that because you don't need to know it. But uh, the whole point is, is this, uh, justification, sanctification, they go together. Good works and obedience, they're attached to the train. But the engine is the gospel, is the power of God, is grace. Uh, you try to put the good works up front to pull the train, uh, you're not going to get very far. You're going to fail. Uh, and so both, they go together. But what can happen and Lutherans have been criticized for letting the pendulum swing too much to the justification side. You're all about, I'm forgiven by the grace of God. I don't have to do anything uh, because God's already forgiven me. And, and that turns into a license to sin. Well, that's not what it is. Uh, so the pendulum of, of, of justification only can swing too far if you leave off the obedience and the good works off the train. They're connected. But then the other problem is when the pendulum swings to the other side and it's sanctification only. And sanctification, which loses its emphasis of justification, good works that get detached from the train Obedience that gets detached from the engine of the gospel becomes nothing more than work righteousness. And, and that's the two dangers of a sanctification only theology. You're either going to become self righteous, holier than thou, and think that God's just got to love you because, wow, I mean, look at you. Uh, the other ditch is sanctification only is despair because you know that you don't love the way God has loved you. You don't obey the way God has, has called you to obey. And if it's sanctification only, you're going to end up in one of those ditches and you don't want to be there. You're going to get derailed. Okay. And this sanctification only theology drains you. It doesn't replenish you. Because all you're going to be thinking about is, uh, well, how good do I have to be? Am, am I being good enough? And uh, me, 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 me. Uh, and that's draining. When you keep on striving for something that, that you can never attain, and that's perfection. That will drain you spiritually and send you into one of those ditches. Whereas the gospel, that balance of justification and sanctification, that replenishes you, that strengthens you, not only uh, knowing that you are a forgiven, blood-bought child of God, but also you know that, uh, that you then have the wherewithal, uh, the power of the engine uh, to do those good works, to bear those good fruits that God calls you upon. It's not either or, folks. It's both and. That's what the Bible teaches. You just got to keep the engine up on the front of the train. The love of God to us and the obedience to God by us, those go hand in hand. That's what we're saying. But there's always the question, why is the one often so hard for us to see? And why is the other so difficult for us to do? Why is it so hard for us sometimes to see God's love? Well, you know as well as I do, all too often all we see is what's, what's right here. Uh, we, we see what's going on around us. And when we took a, a look at what's going on around us, we see a lot of stuff uh, that is not very appealing and that we don't like. And it's the kind of stuff that makes us wonder, where's God? Even, yes, is there a God? Uh, and if there is one, he has a funny way of loving. Uh, and then all the why questions come in there too. Uh, love of God can be hard for us to see because 
it's hidden behind the cross here and now. When he comes again, no problemo. Uh, the love of God will be a clear as a bell. But now, yeah, now the God's love is, is something that we have a hard time seeing because we don't focus on it enough. Uh, we, we don't, we see what's going on around us. Or just as difficult as we, we dwell on what's inside of us. And, and we know that we're not, we're not really loving the way God wants us to love. We know that our, our fruits can be a little uh, weak and a little sour once in a while. Uh, and, and either one can make it hard for us to see the love of God. And then it becomes difficult for us to, uh, to obey him. Uh, because we wonder whether it, it matters. Does it pay? Uh, we take a look around and you say, what, what good does it do for the church to be faithful? All this other stuff happens anyway. Why does it pay for me to live my faith and love the way he loved me? Look what it cost me. Look how hard it is. Um, I want it this way. Uh, I want to go this way. I want, I want the easy road. I want a God that I can work with or a God that will listen to me. Uh, our sinful nature gets in the way. That's, you know, we, we are the children of God. That, that, don't forget that. The gospel is still 100% true. We have that new life in Christ. But this side of heaven, we still have that old Adam, that serpent inside of us. Uh, he, the devil could not defeat the Lord Jesus, and so he turns his attention on you. And until the day you die, uh, you're going to have this constant struggle. The good that I would, I do not. The evil that I would not, that's what I do. St. Paul got it, Romans 7. Uh, and so this is us, here and now. And, uh, or to use, so uh, I figured, what's a, what's a day with all little Latin, right? Uh, we are simul justus et peccator. We are simul at the same time, both just a saint, by the grace of God, and peccator, a sinner. We are Jekylls and Hydes, this side of heaven. Um, and uh, when we let the old Adam have free reign, when we don't feed the new life in us, yeah, then the peccator, the sinner part, is going to dominate. Uh, we keep our faith nourished and strengthened with the means of grace. Uh, we let the Holy Spirit have free reign in us through our baptism and Holy Communion and with the gospel message. Then we know that when God looks at you and me, uh, he sees us wearing uh, the blood and righteousness of his son. And so we're, we're going to have this dual nature until Jesus comes again. And then the old Adam will be buried once and for all. And the new life is ours, confirmed in eternity. So that's why it can be hard for us sometimes to see. The cross gets in the way. Uh, and then it becomes difficult for us to obey. Let's look at the prayer of the day. Uh, this takes us back to that, that tree of faith. The prayer says, inspire us. And if you were to look at some older versions of this, I didn't look in the old Lutheran hymnal, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's there. Another way of inspire really means, uh, God, Father of lights, put your spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit in us. This isn't just, come on, God, inspire me. No, this is, Pour your Holy Spirit into me. And since the Holy Spirit, God tells us, uh, comes to us through the means of grace, the word and the sacraments, uh, that means, you know, inspire us through the means of grace. Put your spirit in us. And, and what to what end? So that we will think those things that are true, which God tells us in his word, and then also long for. So there's the inside and 
the outside to long for those things that are good and which God deems as good, even though sometimes we may not always see and appreciate that. So what important and, and, and what reassuring truth uh, does that prayer offer? Well, first of all, it, it's important because it reminds us that coming to faith, the planting and the growing of the tree, that's God's work. That's the Spirit's work. Third article of the Creed again. You know it. Don't make me say it again. All right. What does this mean? Look it up. That's God's work. That's important to remember that. Uh, you aren't going to climb uh, the tree to eternal life. You're not going to get there. Uh, and it's also important to know that the Spirit is also the one who produces the fruits on that tree. Um, it's important to know that that's God's business too. I, I mentioned right at the beginning when we were uh, contrasting hatred and love, if love is a fruit of the Spirit, and this comes from Galatians chapter 5, by the way, uh, if love is a fruit of the Spirit, well, hatred is a fruit of the devil. It's a fruit of that sinful nature. Uh, so, again, there's our theme for the day. And isn't that reassuring to know that this is God's work in us? Uh, to know that you are a chosen people because God chose you, not because you were so choosable. Uh, we love because he loved us first, not because we're always so lovable, but because God is love. Um, and God showed his love in this, that he gave us his one and only son. That's, that's reassuring. Uh, not only when, when it, it can be a struggle to, and, and we want to uh, produce those fruits and it can be a struggle, it's reassuring to know that, that the Spirit's got our back and that engine is there pulling. Uh, just stay plugged in, stay attached. It's reassuring to know that when we don't produce the fruits, uh, that uh, God still calls us his children in Christ. And he keeps picking us up and keep putting us on the track. All right, those are the verses for the day. Questions, comments, send them my way. Like I said, this is a little tiny epistle, uh, but boy, it's, it's just filled with meat. And we didn't even scratch the surface today, uh, but there it is. Look it over. Spend some time with it. You've got seven devotions if you use the meditations to, to do just that. Uh, when you worship this week and this theme is brought out, in the hymns and in the lessons of the day, the prayer of the day again, uh, you'll have the opportunity to let these truths sink in, take root, and then don't be surprised. Uh, not only don't be surprised if the world wants to push back from that, also don't be surprised if there's some, uh, some nice fruit uh, there too. So speaking of the meditations, you'll have noticed if you're using it and you are very observant that when you get to the end of this week on Saturday, May 23rd, um, the last week of devotions, that part of the meditation is getting pretty thin. Uh, that means this book's just about done. And so it will end. Uh, the last devotion in the booklet will be the following week on, on Saturday, May 30th. And then on Sunday, May 31st, the new meditations will begin. They are here. We have them. I know Pastor will be distributing some of those as he has opportunity to do that. Uh, if you have opportunity to get to church uh, for one reason or another, uh, you can ask for and, and pick up a copy there. Um, who knows uh, how things are going to be changing as far as people getting to church. Uh, you're going to be hearing more about this. Uh, chances are uh, that maybe on the 31st, on that, uh, that Sunday, Pentecost Sunday, uh, we may have some face-to-face -face worship opportunities. It, it's, it's not going to be 
all holds, you know, are loose and we're, there's still going to be some restrictions, uh, but there will be opportunities for you to get the meditations uh, on that day to start your devotions. But many of you won't have that opportunity. And so here's my offer. Uh, free home delivery. I will bring you a meditations. I can't bring you a meditations if you don't ask for one. Uh, and uh, I know that pastor and others will do this. You maybe can pick them up here, but I will bring one. You'll have your own fresh, brand new meditations, unused by contaminated hands, uh, put inside your COVID-19 little bag here. No, this is actually just one of those old evangelism bags we use for vacation Bible school, which I found. We'll stick your meditations in there. And I will come, I will stick it on your door, I will hand it to you, I'll, I'll do whatever. Uh, but if you need a meditation, don't go without, please. Um, if you use them, you'll need it. If you haven't but want to, we'll get one to you, but you got to ask. And, and that's why uh, you need to email me or let the church know, text, call me, whatever, and we will get you uh, a meditations. Okay, there's our closing prayer for the day. Heavenly Father, how great is your love for us that we should be called your children. That is who we are. Amen. Amen. Have a good week. Uh, see you next week. It'll be our last Bible study of the Easter season, and we'll think about and talk about where we will go from there. See you, folks. If not in person, on a screen. If not in person or on a screen, see you in heaven.